Hey there, ladies and gents. Welcome to The Raven and the Writing Desk. I am your host, Chris Lester, the creator of Metamore City. And I am here in the virtual studio with New York Times bestselling author, Gail Carriger. Metamore City. Yeah. Hi. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Tiny technical <laughs> difficulty. In the live stream on my computer. And so I started hearing you twice. Uh, which is wildly confusing, but hello! <laughs> hello, <laughs> welcome! <laughs> For people who don't know, Chris and I are old, old, old friends, but we haven't really seen each other in ages, so this is pretty exciting. I know. Yes, ah. I, I knew I knew Gail back in the day. Uh, we met, actually, it was in the, the winter before Solus came out, so I knew her yeah, before she was famous. <laughs> oh, amazing. There was a before. <laughs> There was a before. I can say I knew her when. <laughs> can. So, Gail is the author of Steampunk Comedies of Manners Mixed with Paranormal Romance. Her books include The Parasol Protectorate, The Custard Protocol, The Supernatural Society, and the Delightfully Deadly series for adults, and the Finishing School series for young adults. She's published in many languages and has over a dozen New York Times bestsellers. Her new novel, or novella rather, Romancing the Adventure, comes out on November 1st, and it is available for pre-order now. So, Gail, why don't you tell us a bit about this story and how it came to be? Yeah, I just... Um, oh, oh, we're going straight into the book. Uh, so this is a, kind of a tie-up, um, sort of like a fanfic. I like to write fanfic for my own characters, basically. <laughs> Madame LeFou is a uh, uh, awesome, tricky inventor, um, brilliant inventor character who uh, shows up in the second book in, of my Parasol Protectorate series. She's a cross-dresser. She owns a hat shop. She's super hot. And, um, and then I also have her as a 10-year-old girl, as a kid, in my Finishing School Young Adult series. And she's a real complicated character right because her motives are often in question especially by the main characters in my other books uh and so i i was always a little scared people wouldn't like her because you never quite know if you can trust her but my <laughs> readers really really seem to gravitate to her so i uh i finally decided she she kind of gets short shrift in the books um i break her heart a lot yes sniff <laughs> i really yeah i really wanted to give her her happy ending and uh, I really wanted to write a lesbian main character. So uh, I did. <laughs> That's the, okay. the beauty of self-publishing and the beauty of writing novellas is I can do whatever I want. So <laughs> have to know. I mean, it helps if you know about her from the previous books, but you really don't have to. It's a total standalone romance. So. Okay, cool. I was going to ask if this is something that where people should catch up with the series first before watching it or not. <laughs> barrier to entry i wouldn't i wouldn't do that to anybody um i think it'll help if you know some of the other characters but uh it's actually really imogen's story so imogen is a parlor maid who gets recruited slash hired to the local vampire hive which is where she meets writing novellas as i can do whatever i want so you're having the same problem as me why are we getting an echo of your past audio that's interesting oh i see what's happening never mind i was gonna have i had the window open to the the youtube chat in order to see what people were saying and it's playing audio so let's get rid of that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so what were we saying oh so this is, this is so in imogen who's the love who's the main love interest is an entirely new character and it's it's her point of view uh, and she was also a really, she's, she's like a, she's a mathematician, um, but she's lower class. So she hasn't really had very much schooling. Uh, and she's, so it's also kind of a class divide love story as well. Nice. And, and there, there's a little bit of an age difference and Madame LeFou is kind of jaded and, uh, and lonely and Imogen is like, what do I have? to do to get her attention it's very cute i really i had so much fun with it so you really don't have to have read anything excellent so i'm particularly excited to talk to you because since the last time that we saw each other you've had a shift in your 
writing career. You've had a lot of books yeah. that were major bestsellers with the, the big New York publishers. Um, but recently you've done a lot of self-publishing. So I want to know what's behind the switch. Ah, the big switch. So I've had, so I, my first book was out in 2009, uh, which was sort of the epic, economic downturn, but they, they did really well. My books kind of, despite that, um, uh, I was out in mass market, which I think helped. So the price point was lower. Um, mm -hmm. Romance readers really gravitated to my books, which meant I had greater ebook sales than a lot of other authors in sci-fi fantasy at the time. Uh, and so th those books really kind of, there was a lot of luck and as well as people just really loving the story when my first books came out. Um, and so trad was really good to me. It was really uh, comfortable. They, uh, my house is very young and took a lot of risks on marketing and I'm pretty game for anything they wanted me to do, you know? Uh, so, uh, you know, online was a little, was kind of a scary place, but in those days, but, um, but we, we, we sailed it together. Um, and then I did Young Adult, which was, a, which was a different publishing house, but under the same umbrella company. So all of my books are published through Hachette in some form or another. During the course of the last almost 10 years, um, it's been a little rocky in terms of uh, like stuff that, frankly, the publishing house couldn't really help. Like I, was, I had a release during the contract negotiations between Amazon and Hachette. Mm impacted my sales for that particular book and then I also had a I had a couple of issues where like Barnes and Noble lost 500 signed editions and I was like what no I, there, there are just a lot of moments where I was like I'm adrift and there's nothing I can do about it and in order to even address the problem there's like five or six middlemen who I have to go through. And it started to feel like those middlemen were between me and my career. Mm -hmm. um, and on the, on the flip side of that, I've also, I've always had a really intimate relationship with my readership. I made, I've always put myself out there because I come from being a big podcasting fan and hanging out with a lot of podcasters who were really early social media experimental experimenters and really, for me, really early self publishers and kind of open my eyes to things like Kickstarters and Patreons and all of this stuff that I think a lot of traditionally published authors have no contact with. So we, it's a scary place, but I had all these friends who were doing, doing it. And so, um, and I, I kind of modeled a lot of my behavior on um, what turned out to be smaller scale for them, but which I just was like, well, it seems really cool to just talk to your, your readers, <laughs> like to just be friends <laughs> Facebook and talk to them on Twitter and I don't I don't feel like I want to be in an ivory tower or anything I, I, I genuinely like social media I know that's possibly not the best attitude in this day and age but I really <laughs> like people um so I, I feel like I was I'm, I'm set already to to start self-publishing I was like I and I, and I ping my fans, like I surveyed my fans a couple of years ago and I was like, who are your favorite side characters? Um, Cause I'm thinking about writing about them. So a, a chat about what you want to see. And, uh, and I keep an eye to people who send me fan mail and say, I love this character and I want to see more of them. Uh, and so I, my last contract, I basically negotiated in a clause that said I could write within this universe with other characters uh, whenever I felt like, so long as I stand or 40,000 words, that's all they really care about. Um, ah, okay. I have to say outside of a month on either side of a traditional release. That was the other like restriction. Mm -hmm. um, for those for those people who don't know, there's a lot of kind of rights grabbing that goes on with the traditional publishing contract. And uh, they would like the, there's something called an option clause, which um, means they have the right to buy the next book that you write. And that option clause can be very broad or very narrow. And a broad one would be something like, I will buy the next book written by you. Uh, that's fiction. And a narrow one would be something like, I will buy the next novel length work written under the name Gail Carragher that is set in an alternate history universe. Mm -hmm. um, as an author, we want a narrow option because it allows us to be very broad with anything else we write. And of course, a publishing house would like a broad option. Uh, my agent's very, very good and got me a very narrow option. 
Um, That's excellent. And then there's a, a couple of other clauses that a publisher can use if they wish to be nasty to kind of grab onto other aspects of your universe in terms of like, you know, like they, they, they would like to own the whole world rather than just the books in it. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, you end up negotiating to play nice with the publisher. Uh, so they'll let me do my little malarking around um, and not frown too heavily on it. And I will uh, still deliver them a new novel on time. And uh, we'll continue with this little hand-holding relationship as long as we can. <laughs> do you have any other um, books with a main publisher coming out soon or no so i had my last book um which was the second book in the custard protocol series which is intended to have at least one more book and maybe two but i'm not committing at this juncture because we are still in contract negotiations uh we have been for like a year mm. That, and it's nothing to do with the hybrid side of things, and it's not nothing to do really with money or anything like that. There's just been a lot of personnel changes going on, and um, you know, like we'll be fighting over a clause and asking for something, and then that will fall through in some for some other weird reason. So it's just been like a an extending series of like we're still waiting. Oh, you're waiting. Oh, yes, we're still waiting for a month, and then finally we get the contract and the clause we just argued about is back in so it's back you know like it's just been one of those back and forth things for just months and months and months and months and months uh, so yeah that is like there are so many reasons for me to go hybrid much as there are so many reasons for me to stay with trad and so but it, it is really a balancing act but one of the hybrid things is like i can write it and then i like the only time frame who i'm dependent upon are like the other freelancers I work with. So like once that book is done, it's as fast as my copy editor can do it. And then it's as fast as my <laughs> proof editor can do it. And then it's as fast as I can get it through the system and get it out. So, you know, I can write and publish a book within six months, which is super exciting <laughs> yeah. for me. Uh, not the least of which is something like this, which I wrote in March of this year is still fresh in my head. And mm -hmm. often when I'm, I'm going out and doing a marketing or a promo <laughs> tour, a traditional publisher it's two or three books ago I don't even remember. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so that this is really exciting because like, yeah, I, I remember what i said <laughs> yay <laughs> so um how has self-publishing changed the way that you write in terms of what you write about or what kinds of content you include or just your writing process <sighs> well um it, they're shorter, so there there are novellas. I'm I'm actually accidentally writing a novel that I'll probably self-publish, just because it's so completely nothing to do with any of my other books that no one would care. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anyone. I don't think a traditional is a really, but that's kind of part of it. Is um, I can be, I can say I, I want to put a lesbian as a main character. Not that my traditional publisher would object to that at this juncture, but I don't have to ask anybody if to for permission to do anything. Mm -hmm that um i like a shorter length i'm really excited Forty thousand words is a really nice length for me especially as i'm concentrating on the romances so there, i don't have all the complexity of, of additional plots to really think about i can have a nice clean quick story that's driven by emotion and that's something i really like writing yeah. uh, i'm i really like the length so that's a big one and, and frankly there are very few publishers who'd be interested in a shorter work of this length anyway right uh, from me, maybe, but probably, and then this is really strictly romance. So uh, most of the uh, publishing houses I have relationships with are science fiction and fantasy. So they, they probably wouldn't be that interested. Uh, so that's another part of it. And then, uh, yeah, and just the complete freedom to write whatever I want next. So I don't have to write an outline uh, for, for when you're an established author with a traditional house so this is, does not count if you're not already established the um, editors will buy the next book from you what's called on spec which means mm -hmm. you just write a little outline for them uh, especially if it's an additional book in a series because you have a proven track record of being able to finish and turn in relatively on time and so um so if i wanted to write a novella for a traditional publishing house i'd still have to write the on spec part of it and then 
I'd have to stick to whatever I said I would do, um, or at least try to. But <laughs> Close when, enough that the editor won't notice. <laughs> exactly. exactly. But when I'm my own boss, I can be like, oh, no. Like, I started writing this most recent novella, um, and I thought I would POV switch back and forth between the two characters, and then that really wasn't working for the novella. So it became mostly just image and story. And I would never have pitched that if I, because I didn't know until I started writing it. So, you know, your own boss is a huge amount of responsibility, of course, but also an immense amount of freedom. And I really like the creative freedom. I don't mind structure. I don't mind guidelines and outlines. But it's really nice, especially in a shorter form, to just be like, I'm going to write this thing. Uh, I'm going to go do it. <laughs> so you um, normally you're an outliner, I know, because I've seen your your work in that writer's retreat that we did together. <laughs> that story Bible was amazing. But yeah. uh you're doing seat of the pants now for these? Somewhat. I have a loose idea. I mean, it's a romance, so I know how it's going to end. <laughs> right. Uh, I have a loose idea of kind of what's going on. And I almost always have what I would, I guess, call pul pulse points, which are sort of scenes I know I'm, that are going to happen and then I'm going to hit at certain times just to keep pace going. Um, so it's a looser outline, but I still have an outline. Once I get into it, I guess I'm more relaxed about allowing myself to write the first couple of chapters, not really knowing where I'm going. And then I'll build an outline. Uh, but you know this story because everyone will sing it. Any author will tell you that every single book is completely different and you're never entirely sure. Like we all have a process, but you're never entirely sure if that's the exact process that's going to work or if you'll yep. be you'll be changing it up, so. <laughs> and no uh, no story outline survives contact with the characters. <laughs> no, exactly, exactly. That's a great way of putting it. And there are certain characters that it's inevitable that they will not survive contact with. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was like, I know if Lord Ogledama intrudes into one of my books that, uh, yeah, I have no idea what's gonna happen. That scene is <laughs> not, it is. <laughs> So um, we're getting s some questions in on the Facebook event page. If you are watching along and you would like to comment, we seem to be having difficulty with the YouTube live um, chat room. But if you are in the Facebook event, we can take questions there. Uh, Rebecca Hunderfund Levis, I hope I'm, I'm not butchering that, says... Uh, <laughs> If you have a chance to speak on it, I'm wondering if there might be a glimmer of hope for a BBC series in the future. Huh. Well, no. Um, <laughs> there's a wild rumor that got out there somehow that I was like negotiating, like, that, that the option was somehow BBC related. I think it has to do with the fact that the original firm to option the movie was Irish money. Uh, but they were just the money. The uh, the women who hold the option are a production team out of L.A. Um, there, there's money in it coming from various different places to try and to try and get it moving. But it, the option was in what 2012 something like that, and, and nothing's happened, guys. <laughs> Nothing. Wow. And and that's normal. Uh, mm -hmm. But an option is like somebody hands you a bunch of money and a squirming puppy and then turns around and walks away. <laughs> Being like, well, I have money. Uh, not sure about this puppy. I now have to control. Um, <laughs> kind of what it's like. Uh, I, I have a lot of this. I mean, the, and the money situation is dire with my books because they're very expensive to produce. Um, they are a foreign location. They are a historical location. They are a costume drama, and uh, they are high CGI because it's both steampunk and supernatural creatures. So that's a lot of funding to raise. Um, so I, I would say it'd be fun, uh, but it seems very unlikely. <laughs> I will tell everybody if anything happens. Um, and I should remind everyone that the author, I have a, I, I believe a good working relationship with my production team, but I have no say in anything. The author almost never does. So mm -hmm. uh, they can do whatever they want with it. When somebody options your book or your series, they're optioning the rights to the world characters, not the story. So that should tell you a lot about some of the book adaptations you have seen in your lifetime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what would really be awesome would be a, um, an anime based mm -hmm. on the manga. 
Yeah, and when they asked me what company I would like the most, I said Studio Ghibli. But like, <laughs> they've already done stuff that's quite similar in strange ways. Like a lot of Studio Ghibli's things are, have like elements like that are in my book already. So I don't think they mm-hmm. want to. Um, and I think that it was offered to some of the an- animated, not, not not just anime, but some of the other houses as well. And they turned it down. So, uh-huh. Dominique, uh, Dominique wants to know uh, what your favorite character to write for is in each of the series besides the main character. This is an interesting question because... Um, some characters are really challenging to write, like Madame LeFou, and so they become favorites because I like the challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, and then some characters I love because they're easy to write, like Lord Akeldama, because they sort of take over and it's like, you know, the fugue is on and I just let him talk <laughs> and type. Thank Mostly you. in italics. Uh, so, <laughs> italics. <laughs> um, so, yeah, those are a couple of them, but th- there are also characters that... Um, I don't know. They, they feel really personal. Most of the main characters feel really personal. So that's the main characters is I, I identify with them the most. That doesn't mean I don't identify with all of my characters, but um, yeah. And then there are, I am a dialogue. Uh, like, what's the word? I love writing dialogue. I, I am inclined towards dialogue as a way uh, to move a story along so um, I have char- two characters that when they're on stage together, they talk well. And those always make me happy to write. So like Alexia and Ivy or Alexia and Connell and a lot of the relationship ones. So like Presha and Gavin are another one or Imogen and, and Genevieve in the new one. So and that's just because I love writing dialogues so of two characters that have a combative relationship and the dialogue is really fun. Or if there are two characters that have a... Um, a cautious relationship that has underpinnings of, of complicated emotions. That's also really fun to write. So it's hard to pick just one depiction wise, but in, in terms of like, I mean, cause the, the other thing is like there are characters that are fun to write because they are silent. So like Bumbersnoot is a great character because I'm driven to try and make people give him a personality when he's essentially an inanimate object. <laughs> weird way flute who's a butler character is kind of similar like he's sort of regarded by all the other characters as slightly part of the furniture because he's just a butler he's just the servant um and so people identifying with him or really loving him is is very exciting for me because i'm like you know he has maybe eight words in all he's in all five of my first books and that's about as much as he speaks and people are like i love flute so much and i'm like you know, his screen time is minimal and his dialogue is practically non-existent, but, and yet you loved him. So therefore, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. So some authors take all of the stories in a given setting and put them into one overarching umbrella series. I'm thinking like Terry Pratchett did with Discworld. Everything's Discworld, regardless of whether he was writing young adult or, you know, um, uh, yeah. graphic novels or whatever but you're doing something different you're taking the stories that are set in the same world and you're breaking them into different brands and so uh, how did you come up with that and what's the reasoning behind the strategy uh i don't know i had a, a strategy per se uh i guess it was more that i've always admired people like Anne mccaffrey and uh, mercedes lackey who write series of or and standalones but they're all kind of within one umbrella world so my my readers have decided that it's called the parasol verse my world so we'll just refer to it as that uh, i have accepted this it is good um so the parasol verse is like this umbrella but you have a sandbox that you can then play in with established rules but you can write in the future or the past or you can write for young adults or adults now uh, Lucky and McCaffrey didn't really technically write for YA because it kind of didn't exist. Uh, but I would make a very strong case that, for example, Lackey's Arrows Fall, which is in her Valdemore universe, um, is definitely YA. And McCaffrey's Dragon Song trilogy is also quite distinctly young adult. So um, I think they were doing what I'm doing. It just didn't have quite the same monitoring. And I think also kind of branding and 
cover art is, has experienced a dramatic seed change in the age of the internet and in visual interfacing. So uh, that is also part of it. But me in the background is more like, I like the sandbox, built it, and I'm just going to play with it, play in it. And then I have the luxury of self-publishing as well. So I can really play, and, and I can even move different genres, and that's what I'm doing. Like I'm writing lesbian romance and I wrote sort of an espionage romance for my first novella um, and I can write short stories that are in the same universe um, and the contemporary one that I'm working on right now could conceivably be a modern day version of that universe so um, but it's male male and it's going to be super 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 sexy so like but I, I get to do that because I I, I I have this world, I have this internet universe now that is also something my universe is within. So, mm -hmm. so when you create these different um, lines, like the, the supernatural society um, is all going to be LGBT romances, claw and courtship is all, it's werewolf. all werewolf straight romance. So um, this is just, <laughs> what's that? We'll see. The werewolf one could be some adventure stuff as well. It doesn't, that one won't necess doesn't necessarily, but it's all going to be werewolf. Um, so when I was, why did I just, part of that is because, um, so I am an archaeologist by training, which means I'm very object oriented. Um, and I am interested in, and I like the idea that what we want as readers and as fans is uh recognizable visual markers that tell us what we're getting into. And so um, when I was talking with my cover art designer, Starla Hutchton, um, who does all of my self-publishing stuff, we pretty like clearly wanted specific things that would mark the books as sort of different. So here, let me, let me get you. She, she, she jumps away for a second. Um, book and you can say they they found is is uh, blank toned um and so and this is the adult line so what we wanted to do was hearken to the adult line but we put the sort of paint swipe thing instead um use a sort of a similar font so that it was still like in the same kind of family but instead of a single figure we put two figures of the same sex so that it was still, it's still kind of marries to it, but it's different enough so that people are like, okay, it's a Gail Carragher book, but there are two figures clearly romantically involved with each other. So everybody knows immediately that it's romance. Because right. I don't want, I don't want my young adult readers picking it up and, you know, they're going to get an education. Um, <laughs> Is this a kissing book? <laughs> but yes, it's a kissing book. Um, so I kind of want, I want, I, I want people to know what they're in for and not be upset with me for not visually telling them what's going on. So, um, I mean, there's a lot of other stuff on, in here about like me loving the image and all that sort of stuff, but like from a purely informative stance, the cover art has to say something and the lines, the, the, the different novella lines are kind of a means to also say something like if you're going to pick up a supernatural society novella, then this is what you get. You get um, lesbian romances and gay romances that are still set in my universe. That's what you're getting. You're getting queer. Um, and so it's always going to be two figure, same sex couples or similar on the cover. Uh, so you always know that that's a supernatural society novella. Um, and uh, so the Poison and Protect books are, I, I, don't, I don't have the delightfully deadly. Oh, maybe I do. She, she keeps disappearing. <laughs> no, I have one here in the office, but it's The boys in our project. Um, so I want to talk for and I can show what I mean because this is kind of fun stuff. Like I love this kind of thing. <laughs> I'll be right back. For those of you who are listening to the audio of this after the fact, Gail has just gone to grab um, some cover art to show us to uh, illustrate the differences she's talking about. You can. Uh, Go and watch the the video of this still on my YouTube channel uh, if you are hearing this on the podcast, um, and you'll be able to see what we're talking about. I'm not really describing. Um, 
Kill and Protect is the first of the Delightfully Deadly novellas, and they are adult spinoffs from my YA. And so for them, we wanted to hearken to the YA series. So the YA series has a colored background with a um, sepia tone or black and white figure. So we borrowed that idea and did the same thing with a sort of wallpaper cover background. But then we, I went with this paint slash thing, which all of the novellas will have. Um, and then a single figure, but we chose, we're gonna have single figures that are sexier. So, pe so everybody knows that uh, this is sort of espionage romance. Um, so, you know, so th again, the, the cover is, is not, not just has to be what you like and want, but it also has to tell the readers what they're in for, or you are up. They're thinking that it's one thing and then through no fault of yours or theirs, they begin reading it and then feel betrayed by you because the cover isn't telling them what they thought they were going to get. Um, and then they can lash out at the author as a result of that, um, sometimes quite brutally. <laughs> when mm -hmm. the author, for a traditional author, the author is like, I'm sorry, I don't have any control over my cover, but I do. So I, I, I feel compelled to make sure that people really know what's, what they're in for when they pick up one of these books. I mean, they're all still me. They all still have a lot of humor and they're all still kind of this casually informal Victoriana language. And they're all full of manners and tea and silliness, uh, but <laughs> but the mainstay of the, and the plot drivers are going to be slightly different, and the and the main characters are going to be slightly different depending on which line. And I need the cover, and uh, and the series description to sort of say say that. Got it. Alexa Osborne oh. wants to know about Randolph, Lyle, and Biffy. You left their relationship in imprudence up in the air. What will happen to them? I did. So I've been planning to write the uh, novella for those two um, for a while. It'll be the it'll be the next Supernatural Society novella. So Madame Le Fou and, and Im or Genevieve and Imogen are first, and then Biffy and Lyle are next. I haven't written it yet, so I don't know when. <laughs> I don't even know what length. I've been thinking for a while that it would be a novella, but I'm beginning to think it might be a novelette or even a short story. Um, in mind so I go relieve them and one of the reasons that it wasn't the first Supernatural Society novella because it is the most requested uh, was because uh, it, it, it temporally it fits in after imprudence so if you like to read my books in the order that they occur in universe then this their story which will uh, will, be, will be called Romancing the Werewolf which only publishing so uh, that book was out before I before I brought out yeah <laughs> the answer is like these novellas are, are what I want to do when I want to do it so I'm waiting to want to do that one I know everybody else wants it from me but there's also immense pressure that Biffy and her in so many of the books. Uh, there's a lot for me to get wrong that rereaders and Uber fans would notice. So uh, I need to I need to do some rereading of my own and some of my my own books like Solace I haven't read since it came out. So I haven't read it in like seven or eight years. So I need to go back and make sure I I don't get things wrong. I needed to line up some beta readers who are really familiar with with all of my work and with my universe to to double check me and tell me because I really don't like I don't like the angry emails from fans when I get something wrong in my own universe that I should have known better. Um, it's one of those it's lessons. Very I have embarrassing. <laughs> it's a lesson I've learned from being going from being an avid reader to be and an avid rereader to being an avid. Uh, author, which is, uh, I don't like rereading my own stuff. Mm. I will read the Song of the Lioness by Tamara Pierce every year until I die, probably. And I will catch those eight mistakes that irritate me about continuity every single time I reread those four books. But I don't reread my own stuff because uh, all I catch is mistakes, which I can't fix. So, um, yeah, so I, I finally was like, well, in base, perhaps I should. Have them. <laughs> so that's what I've been slowly doing. 
Um, yeah, uh, so I also needed to set that up uh, before Biffy and Lyle in particular because it's so anticipated. The pressure is kind of... Um, so I think I'm having a little nervous writer blocky maybe-ness about it as well. Um, but it's slated for me to write when I'm on my next writing retreat, whether I like it or not. So um, if all else fails, I'll be writing the rough draft, the rough draft, which is nowhere near finished, but the rough draft in, in uh, late February next year. So it will happen. Once I've written the rough draft, it's, it's merely a matter, a matter of pushing it to production. So you, I'm hoping, hoping you will get it next year. But I'm not. Really, the, but go don't, ahead. Don't, don't, if you're a Goodreads librarian, don't freaking put like they did. Um, because then I get blamed if that if it doesn't happen. And I, if I haven't written it, I, I can't commit to a publication. <laughs> so earlier this year, you formed Gail Carriger LLC. What was the reason for that move? And what does an LLC give you as an author that you can't do with the sole proprietorship? Uh, legal protection, uh, to be brutally honest. Um, pretty much that was my mainstay reason for doing it. It allows me to write contracts between uh, freelancers and use a lot of as a self publisher and a company rather than a corporation uh, I mean, rather than an individual and it allows me certain uh, estate things as well so I can leave my legacy um, in a different way than when you're an individual so those were some of the reasons I did it um, is one of those things that after a certain amount of time one's agent and one's lawyer which one has especially if one has a film deal start to bug you <laughs> Like, you might consider incorporation. Uh, I don't have employees, and I don't share my incorporation with any other individuals, so it's just an LLC rather than a C-Corp or an S-Corp. Um, and it's me, so I spent about a year doing all the research and reading all the nonfiction books on why and making a pro and con list. Um, so <laughs> it took a while. I. Uh, it's funny because a lot of... There are many reasons to go hybrid, and there are actually reasons to stay with a traditional publishing house. Um, but one of the upticks in the traditional publishing house side, which can work for or against an author, but in my case, it's almost universally worst worked for me, is that a big publishing house has a team of lawyers. And uh, if someone comes after you and you've done everything right, which I hope that I have, <laughs> you know, I don't infringe on other people's copyright it's all original uh but when someone comes after you and says that's my thing that you're using on your book cover um if the book cover came out of house then the author gets to say meet my team of lawyers <laughs> um so one of my i'm very risk averse and one of my reasons for wait i i i had a number of these happen um had the resource of a big publishing house at my back. So I, I think it's one of the consequences of steampunk is that uh, people uh, trademark and fringe quite severely a lot and, mm. and uh, copyright infringements. And then I have in conversations with other authors had them experience. So uh, the team of lawyers was really great. So uh, I, I wanted to protect myself as far as much as I could. That makes sense yeah um so if you could go back to that time when we first met uh before solace came out and you were just about to make it as an author what advice would uh, you give to yourself well i probably wouldn't have taken any of the advice but, uh, <laughs> even from future me that's a really hard question. I mean, I think I would have told myself to, uh, I, I think I, I might have liked her. Oh, you know what I would have told myself from the get-go? Keep your fucking Wikipedia. Like, because <laughs> I did story Bibles, which you saw, and written things, and then, like, couldn't find anything. It was ill-organized, and it just, like, I, I didn't realize First of all, I wrote Soulless without realizing it was going to be a series. And then I wrote Changeless without realizing it was going to be a five book series. And then I finally figured out, and then I realized, oh, I'm going to write a YA book in the same universe. 
was completely um i should have kept a record of all the characters all like my notes and stuff just online and with a big spoiler warning on it for anybody who was brave you know like and, and my wikipedia my wiki is now crowdsourced and and very good but i ended up um having to hire build i i hired a remote assistant books and 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 i still will go to a character page and be like oh it doesn't say what color eyes they had um this continuity is something i really worry about so I, I really wish I had kept that from the get-go because there were certainly mistakes I made these things where I had mentioned something in a different series or whatever. And I, my editor at the time, but because it was either a different editor's book series or it was just too far back. Um, and if I just had the wiki, I probably would have caught it. So yeah. it's getting pretty dark. I'm going to turn the mic. <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, keep your wikis. Keep them intact. But <laughs> still. Um, what advice, other than keep your wiki, keep your wiki. Uh, up to date, um, would you give to a writer who's looking to get started now? Particularly, um, I'm interested in whether you think it's still worthwhile for people to make the attempt to go through the agent hunt and then looking for a publisher or going directly to publishers or focusing on self-publishing. This is going to make me slimely unpopular, but mm. so here we go. Um, I think suffering the gate keepers is a good uh, training session. First of all, I think everybody should get used to rejection because mm. uh, all authors are going to be subjected to nasty reviews whether you like it or not. Trust me, you might think that book is the most brilliant thing in the universe. Someone out there hates it. They will tell you about it colorfully and online and to your face. So uh, get used, so like having to go through the gatekeeper process of submitting to agents and stuff, I think it's a real good rejection. Uh, yeah, authors hate that. But it's also really like <laughs> The skill set that you learn, having to write a query letter, having to write query emails, like that business skill set, as an author, it is going to be the most important thing you have for your career going forward, whether you are traditionally published or whether you are self-published. You probably will need it more if you are self-published, but it's a business. If you want to, if what you want from your book is for it to go out into the world and for you to earn a living off of it in any way, uh, then your passion is becoming your business. And so uh, you have to be okay with that and you should learn how to run your passion as your business. So you're not gonna be successful, you'll just be a hobbyist. That's fine. Uh, there's always the option of just putting stuff up for free. I think that the tr trad has that in its favor. <laughs> It does, it did give me an entire platform. So uh, I, got, I got a lot of boosts because of the time when my first book come out, came out and distribution. So Borders still existed, both Borders and my cover art and bought a lot of my first book and put it out everywhere. So I had a lot of like boost from that, uh, which it is really difficult to do if you're self-publishing. The other thing I always say to self-publishers, especially if, you're younger or it's your first or second book is somebody took that seventh grade essay that you loved and published it for you. Awesome. Would that feel like to see writing like that with your name on it? Um, so the book that you love is probably not as good as you think it is. Um, the other thing I would say is if you decide to reject the model of traditional publishing and an agent is that you must get yourself edited. You, you need a developmental editor and you need a copy editor at the very least. And you probably need a proof pass editor as well. Please proof your book. Yeah. <laughs> You don't proof your book. Someone else proofs your book and not your girlfriend, not your husband. A professional proofs your book, guys. And that means you'll be paying good money for it. Um, and you should. 
<laughs> so I guess that's the other thing I would say. You don't need to go to that expense if you are soliciting for traditional publishing, uh, although you should be handing in the cleanest manuscript you've got. Uh, but if you are going to consider rejecting all of those models, um, then please, 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 please uh, have a professional look at it in some capacity first. And a legitimate professional, not a, not a scaremonger or, or, a, or a scam. And there are lots of those out there too, more than ever. Uh, yeah, the agent is a different, a whole different kettle of fish. And uh, I will say that I wouldn't sign any contract ever, any contract ever under any circumstances without a literary agent, a legitimate literary agent. Uh, at the very least, if not an IP lawyer as well. Um, and that includes with, say, Amazon, if Amazon Publishing approaches you and says, hey, we really like your book. You still need an agent. Let's see. Let's see the other one. There's a reason that a lot of the really big name indie authors, when push came to shove, at the very, they got a literary agent. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, if merely to have a middleman who handles, you know, film inqu inquiries and things like that. So what's next from you? Where can, what can we uh, expect from Gail in the coming year? Well, uh, the, the next novella is out at the beginning of next month, which feels like it's right around the corner. Um, yeah, and then next year uh, will probably be the Biffy and Lyle novella once I read it. And then this, this uh, contemporary piece that I'm working on right now, it should be done by the end of this year, and I'll put that one into production as well. And that will be something completely different. It'll be, a, again, a totally different kind of style of cover and... Um, by the contents, because the contents will be shocking. Uh, so those are some of the two things I have in the hopper right now. And then I'll be kind of novellas and stuff until I have a, a new book contract. So that the, the only leverage I have with traditional publishing to speed them along is the fact that, that I refuse to start writing until I've signed. So... Uh, The so I love it. I've become one of those authors who's like deadline. Ha! Huh. <laughs> I'll try for it, but uh, but you know the, the publishing house will will take get it when they get it and push it to market when they push it to market. You know, like uh, um, you have. I have the luxury of being slightly more relaxed about things now than I used to be. I used to be so nervous and worried about making my deadlines all the time, and now I'm kind of like you know. It'll be fine. It'll be okay. Uh, the worst, like when my my Uber fans come up to me and they're like, "Oh, oh we need another book. We can't. Oh, we can't wait." Um, I always say it could be worse. I could be George R. R. Martin, and then you are waiting seven years, and I will kill your favorite character. So, be patient. <laughs> Have you read this other book? Uh, I I want. I run a, a book group now, and uh, I'm on Goodreads quite a bit. So you can always find me recommending books that you should. You should be reading in the interim. Uh, I love you guys, but uh, there's lots of other authors that are awesome out there who you should, can also read, like Chris, <laughs> for example. <So. laughs> One more question from our audience. I'll two, well, there's a question and a comment. Uh, Rebecca right. says, loving your glasses, Gail, always spot on with your style. <laughs> it's raining, so I had to cover my hair. And Millie at, or Mildred Katie says, is there something that you never thought you'd do slash write when you started that you either have written or plan to write, for example, a oh genre or, they, or a type of character? Oh, wow. Yes. Um, for, so I knew when I was writing Solace that it was a romance. It, it's a romance in the traditional Victorian sense of the word, isn't it? It's a gothic romance, basically. So uh, all of you who read it, Surprised. It did have a pink cover. Um, <laughs> but it's from um, male readers who will come up to me and be like, You made us read a. How did that happen? I'm like, it's okay. The rest of the books in the series aren't like that. <laughs> but <laughs> um, but I, I wasn't. I, I suppose if you asked me at the beginning, Right, like intentionally writing straight romance, prob like straight romances in for the romance genre specifically, wasn't something I ever thought I would do. And I think um, 
gra more graphic sex scenes is something that terrifies me. It still terrifies me. Nookie is like the hardest thing as far as I'm concerned to write. Um, <laughs> it's just so hard. Really hard, hard, hard. Yeah, it's really, it's, it's very challenging to not make people wince. Um, and it's very challenging to have it be sexy without crossing into crude into some in some of my books but also i don't know I, my the cop out in a lot of my adult fiction is um i use a lot of humor in the sex scenes and i i draw on I, on the piece i'm working on right now i do draw on that as well um because sex is hilarious if you ask me um it's a lot of fun but it's also really funny uh, so I guess th the fact that I would be writing intentionally this much Nookie would come as a huge shock to me because they were my <laughs> right early on. Uh, and the fact that I'm writing contemporary male male romance is, is par like paranormal romance, uh, sh aka shifter porn, is totally surprising to me. <laughs> um, I was like, I don't know where this is coming from, but okay, <laughs> write it, yay! Uh, so yeah definitely there's a lot of stuff that's surprising about my writing in terms of like the non-writing like the fact that my career as an author makes me travel as much as it does is also really really it's continually surprising uh, i am off to singapore next month and i'm like who knew who knew writing a book about uh vampires werewolves and steampunk with a kick-ass main character was going to take me to Singapore. This is not a thread I would have drawn in my life. <laughs> any uh, final questions or? So we don't have any more questions that I'm seeing on the feed. I'm just checking right now, refreshing to make sure I didn't miss anything. So um, best way for people to keep uh, informed on what you're up to, that would be the mailing list, right? My mailing list is definitely the best. It's just once a month, uh, unless I have a release, and then I'll send you a, a little ping that says, hey, the book's out. Um, so the most you ever get from me is two things a month. The mailing list is also, like, it's where I give away stuff. It's where I... Um, you know, I'm way more casual on the mailing list. I feel like I'm really among friends there, so I can be a, t a tiny bit more honest than just shouting into the void of, of public facing internet. Um, so it's a little bit more like this, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> um, yeah, but you can, I'm on almost all social medias. Uh, I talk the most with like fellow authors. The place. my books with called the parasol protector group and they are really really active and really friendly and super chirpy and nice and fun and always sharing pictures of fabulous dresses and octopi and so that's a really fun place to hang out if you're if you're a facebook person um and then i'm on like if you want character boards and visual inspirations i'm on pinterest and uh i post pictures of uh, you know pretty pictures of books and my corsetry on instagram so i'm like pretty much anywhere you might want me to be it's kind of what do you what do you want from me? <laughs> um, but definitely the newsletter is best and you can find that on my website or uh, whatever. It's all, it's all good. Uh, don't friend me on Facebook because uh, I have other announcements and stuff like that. Um, and then the group, if you really want to chat, I actually interface and talk to people more on the group than I will on my Facebook page. So if you friend me on my Facebook page, chances are I'm probably capped out on friends anyway. And uh, the other thing is like, it's just not going to be, it's going to be the same thing you see on the, on the page on my regular feed. So um, it's, it's not, friending me is not the best. I mostly. All right. Anything else? No, that's it. Thank you so much for being on the Raven and the writing desk, Gail. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. It was a real, real pleasure. And uh, yeah, best of luck with your own projects going forward, man. Thank you.